Hi, everybody. Greetings from Durham, North Carolina. So I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is that I've got a gig, which is exciting. It's the opening week of the national tour of the Broadway show, The Band's Visit, which is directed by David Cromer. It has music and lyrics by David Yazbek, and it has a book by Itamar Moses, and it features yours truly as the onstage clarinetist. So look at our schedule and see if we're coming to your hometown and maybe come see me. The bad news is that I'm going to be making score study videos from this point forward for the next year or so on the road, which means I don't have most of the gear in my studio. So it might take me a few videos to get the quality of my content back up to where it once was, but God damn it, I'm going to try. For example, I'm literally re-recording this script right now because yesterday I recorded it and the audio sounded so shitty because I have a new Rode VideoMic Pro and setting it up is completely counterintuitive. I hope this sounds better. Today, I wanna to talk about Caroline Davis. If you're not hip yet to Caroline's music, what the f are you waiting for? Get to it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Caroline is a saxophonist, flutist, vocalist, composer, and just incredible person that I've been looking up to for many years now. And her new album, Portals, Volume One, Morning is, in my opinion, one of the most remarkable jazz adjacent recordings to have come out in 2021. Portals is Caroline's sixth album as a leader, and it is really ambitious, featuring a stellar quintet plus a string quartet. It is also her most personal recording by far, as it was written in the months following the sudden and unexpected death of her father. The last track on this album, Worldliness and Non-Duality, immediately caught my ear and I asked Caroline if she would help me understand its inner workings. Little did I know that it is filled with phantom secrets, which simultaneously informed Caroline's writing process and also helped her work through the trauma and grief of losing a parental figure. See, the title of the composition is a reference to Caroline's father's last earthly utterances to her. And then he texts me back and call, you know, calls right after and he's just like, you know, I'm, I'm working on how to accept duality and then to non-duality. So that was the last thing that I heard him say and he also wrote it. Mm -hmm. I was like, could you write me that in a text? <laughs> And so yeah, that was it. And this piece sort of, that was, where can I start? This is where I can start, you know? Just as Caroline's dad was grappling with his transition from this world to the next, Caroline too was trying to understand the concept of non-duality via musical expression. In Caroline's view, worldliness is duality. Ourselves and our souls are distinct from the world around us. But every human being is destined to cross over into an unknown universe of non-duality, becoming one with everything. And so the music she wrote during this growth period of grappling with mortality embodies these ideas. Dichotomies assert themselves and then dissolve into one another. Composed material becomes indistinguishable from improvisations. Melodies morph before our very ears into harmonies. The line between consonance and dissonance blurs. The familiar becomes unfamiliar and vice versa. And underneath it all, cosmic forces known only to the creator dictate the inevitable unfolding of the music. This is Score Study with me, Brian Kroc. You'll see in, these, in this sketch, you'll see that uh, there are a lot of lyrics for each one of the 10 pitch class groupings that are in each of the seven phrases that are in the first part of this. Wow, that's Part so one, yeah. unspoken words and hidden numbers. When Caroline arrived at the McDowell Colony in 2019 for a composition residency, the wounds from her father's recent funeral were still fresh. I was writing these sort of sketches and most of that happened in the McDowell Colony. And I almost canceled my residency there because we had to go to Switzerland for the funeral. And that was just like a whole thing. And um, I was thinking, should I stay longer in Switzerland and help or 
but ended up just going for the funeral and coming right back and then going straight to going straight to New Hampshire from Dell and going through that residency program for a couple of weeks. The most that she could bring herself to do with her time at that point was simply to be present and to listen to the sounds of nature happening all around her and to write lyrics about those sounds. All of these lyrics are very about the environment. <laughs> As you can hear, Caroline's lyrics generated the music, but she decided to leave them unuttered on the album, just as the creatures who generated the sounds in her cabin were heard, but still unknown. Caroline also chose numbers associated with the date of her father's passing and inserted those into the music. He died on February 25th, 2019. So she chose the numbers two and five which added together equal seven, and one and nine, which equal 10. You can hear these numbers at work in the very first phrase of the music, which has 10 notes with seven distinct pitches. In addition, Caroline inserted unspoken mantras into the music. For example, in measure 22, we hear a subtle rhythmic gesture. Da 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 da. This comes from the phrase, working on how to accept duality. And as soon as the seed is planted, it grows and flourishes until the culmination of the entire composition, when we hear the ensemble play it in rhythmic unison at measure 99. Not only did these words and numbers serve a generative function for Caroline's writing process, but they also had a very real emotional impact on her performances as she was meditating on them while she was recording in the studio. I feel like I was in tears when we were recording this, just knowing that what was coming or just knowing that my dad was going through that and thinking about that while I'm recording. Mm. And I d very much do think about the message and like the deepness of the message while I'm improvising or I try to orient myself to that because it means so much to me. Part two. Writing for strings. With this record, Caroline contributed to the gorgeous canon of albums of saxophone players with strings. And there's tons of beautiful examples, but some of my favorites are Charlie Parker with strings, Greg Osby's Symbols of Light, A Solution, Stan Getz's Focus, and Ingrid Laubrock's Contemporary Chaos Practices. Prior to making this record, Caroline hadn't really written for strings before, so I was curious, what resources was she checking out? Had you written for strings previous to this? No. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was a challenge. Did you have any like um, particular like pieces or like writers or um, books that you were checking out to like yeah. own up on that stuff? Or? Yeah, it was funny because I wasn't prepared for the McDowell Colony as I wanted to be prepared. So when I came there, there was this book in my cabin that was called like Instrument Instrumentation Orchestration by Alfred Bladder. Do you have that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that book was like it, it was not, like the hard copy version from. I swear to God, this book was so old, and it was this hard copy version, and I was scared to move the pages because it was like they were so crusty. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so fucking cool. In addition to that Alfred Bladder book, Caroline found examples from 20th century composers that related to the concept of this record. There's a, there's certain people I feel like I was influenced by with string writing and like Ligeti is a big one. The Tension released in Thomas Addis. She took direct influence from John Cage's string quartet in four parts, specifically the contrast, dare I say duality, 
of its second movement. It's like the end of the second movement of that piece. He uses these two worlds. Um, it sounds to me like this quiet festival in like the North Downs of England, uh -huh. where you're like it's Surrey or like. <laughs> You're between Surrey and Kent, and you're just in these hills, foothills of England, or, or the South Downs, or whatever. Uh -huh. And you're like at this festival, and there's these strings playing, you know, and it's kind of off in the distance, and that's just it, but it's just parses moments of that. And then there's this very stark, like, dissonant, clustery, and people are using, you know, harmonic fingerings in that very much so in that piece. And so he's kind of going back and forth at the end of that movement. Yeah, he goes back and forth between those four worlds, and I was, I remember that being direct influence on me. Interesting, cool. Part three, duality dissolving into non-duality. In addition to checking out Schubert, Cage, Ligeti, and Addis, Caroline also studied Witold Ludoslawski who is known for writing aleatoric music, amongst many other things. Aleatory simply involves elements of random choice in a piece of music, allowing the performers to decide certain parameters of a musical element, making sure that the music is going to sound different every single time it's played. So Caroline molded this to fit her project. For example, in measure five, all the string players are given dyads with the instruction to play them in any octave and with any rhythm. Take a listen to how that sounds. When I first heard worldliness and non-duality, I found myself completely uncertain as to what was written material and what was improvised. And Caroline exploits that dichotomy throughout the composition. In fact, it's basically the form of the whole piece of music, with short segments of written material juxtaposed in rapid succession with short bits of improvisation. As a listener, I listened to this a couple times before you sent me a score. Mm -hmm. So like as a listener, I was genuinely not sure like when improvising started and when the written stuff started happening again. Were you purposefully trying for that or did that is that yeah, I mean, I love that so much. I yeah, there's so many groups that where I I'm looking at Matt Mitchell and Kate Gentile's like yeah, Gentile's yeah. record right now, and they're two people I love their music because you can never tell, you know, yeah. and that's my favorite. Yeah. And you can't tell. And or your like, music too, just what the seamless transition from written to improvised material. I love that. Me too. What makes this album so special is that in working to find peace with the idea of duality and non-duality as it relates to the afterlife, Caroline was successful in representing that very idea musically. Her compositional inspirations, poetry, numbers, and philosophy are there to be witnessed if the listener is willing to undertake the search. And to be honest, I've barely scratched the surface with this record in this short video. So you need to go listen to it closely yourself. Like so many great artists before her, Caroline channeled the raw wounds of the passing of a parental figure into high art. And I'm reminded of Carrie and Lowell by Sufjan Stevens, or even Kanye West's Donda. The death of a parent changes the world for a child. And these great artists do humanity a service by publicly grappling with these heavy and confusing emotions. Only weeks before speaking with Caroline, my wife's grandfather passed away at the age of 100. And Molly and I had been spending a lot of our private time discussing death. What is the significance of our time on Earth? And what does it mean to pass into the next realm? Caroline Davis's Portals record found me at precisely this moment and helped me work through my feelings. And this might be the highest function that art can serve allowing both the creator and the consumer to heal. <laughs> 